All right, you can be seated here and at home. Listen, we're going to keep going in our series about the seven feasts of the Lord. Tonight, I want to stay on the seven feasts of the Lord. I want to stay on specifically the Feast of Trumpets, but we're going to come at it tonight from another angle, okay? Because Jesus did. We're actually technically... um, kind of right here at the end. It's a two-day feast. We're right at the end. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, go back to last week's sermon. Listen, it's fantastic. It's a little bit of a precursor for tonight, but tonight also stands alone, okay? One of the things I just have to do, I just have to do, if you can bear with me, is I want to blow the shofar again. Would that be okay with you? Yes. All right. All right. does something to you every time, right? Yes. All right. Well, listen, again, I want to encourage you to go back and listen last week to the message because though we can't be 100% certain, we learned that this feast, the Feast of Trumpet, could prophetically point to that moment when Jesus takes the church out of the world. The Apostle Paul says that it'll happen in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He writes to the people in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 4, and he says, For the Lord himself will uh, descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up That word caught up means to be snatched away or to be stolen away. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will always be with the Lord. Okay, so we've come to know this event as the rapture. Because the word caught up in Latin, which was a, a, a prominent version of the Bible for a while, That word is rapturo. In the Greek language, that phrase would be harpazo, caught up. One word in the Greek, harpazo. I've even heard biblical scholars, teachers only use that word when they're talking about the rapture. I don't say rapture. I say harpazo. Be ready for the harpazo. (laughs) Doesn't really matter what we call it, does it? Hey, I need you this morning. I need you this morning. Okay? Okay. It doesn't matter what we call it. What's important is that we believe that it will happen. And that we're prepared when it does. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Okay, so the title of this sermon is, Get With the Program. Get with the program. And this whole sermon in one sentence is this. Write this down. Pay attention to the program if you want to be carried away to the place he has prepared for you. We're going to be in John 14. You're welcome to turn there. It's going to be up on the screen. This is Jesus talking. And he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, what's obvious to us is that Jesus is talking about his second coming, okay? More specifically, the time when he will come and steal away his church. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, But the people he's talking to that day, the people who are standing there that day, didn't just hear about an event. They understood the itinerary. The who, the what, the why, the when, the how. Remember, Jesus was Jewish. 
And Jesus did things that Jewish people do. He said things that Jewish people say. He said things that Jewish people would understand and relate to. When he said, I go to prepare a place for you, the people would have been like, Because Jesus was referencing the Jewish custom of marriage. Here's what they would have heard. I, Jesus, am your groom. And you are my bride. Now all the single ladies that day would have been like, oh, 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 oh. They'd be like, I'm getting married! And the guys would have been like, I'm out. I'm done. This ain't right. <laughs> Jesus was using wedding lingo. And this wasn't the first time. One time the disciples were asking him about fasting. And he likens himself to a bridegroom. In Matthew 25, which we're going to look at in a little bit, Jesus uses the wedding, the Jewish wedding, as a parable about the end times. We're all familiar with this idea because of popular scriptures like Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church, gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her with the washing of the water of the word. Uh, Revelation 19, that chapter's familiar to us where he says, for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, I'm jealous for you. Talking to the Corinthian church, I'm jealous for you with a godly Jealousy, I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. The Apostle Paul understood that his role in the body of Christ was to help the body of Christ become that pure and spotless bride. And I really, I really believe that's my role in the body of Christ as well. And so this morning, hopefully, I can bring some clarity to this passage of scripture, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So in the Hebrew culture, when a young man saw the girl that he wanted, And I feel like you're going to need maybe uh, something to help visualize this morning. So take a look at this. This will help you. When a young man saw the girl he wanted, he would approach her with a marriage contract. He'd come to her house with a contract, a, a formal binding agreement called a ketubah. A ketubah gave the terms by which he would propose marriage. It it contained all the promises that he was making to her. One of the most important things in the ketubah was the price he was willing to pay in order to marry this girl. It was called the bride price, and it was a big deal because it communicated to this young lady that her groom was willing to sacrifice all of his money, all of his possessions, whatever it took for her to become His bride. That's how much he loved her. That's how much he wanted her. Whatever it takes. I sold two guitars to buy Melissa's wedding ring. (laughs) If you know me, you know that's a big deal. That was a sacrifice. That spoke volumes of how much I wanted this young lady. Amen? Amen? So the girl and her father would would consider this contract, and if everything looked good, the bride and the groom would break bread, and they would drink a cup of wine together. This was their way of saying, I do. It confirmed his willingness to uh, sacrifice anything, everything, in order to have her. And it communicated her willingness to wait For him, see, this wasn't the wedding. This was the engagement. At this point, they are only betrothed. The wedding would come later, like much later. 
When the couple finished eating the bread and drinking the wine, the groom would make a little speech. He would square up with her, look her right in the eyes, and make a little speech. One of the things that he would literally say to his bride-to-be is, I go and prepare a place for you. Then he would return to his father's house. At his father's house, he would begin working on a bridal chamber, a dwelling place for his bride. It might have been a room inside of his father's house. It could have been a completely separate structure altogether somewhere on his father's property. But what we know is that for the groom and his bride, this is going to be a mansion, right? How many of you married couples remember your very first dwelling place? <laughs> Mine and Melissa's very first dwelling place. Our apartment was about the size of this stage. You know what I'm saying? And the air conditioner was a window unit in the window right by the front door. And so you had the, the um, living room and then there was this wall that you had to go around to the bedroom and the air wouldn't make it back to the bedroom. It was hot always in there. And so Melissa and I, the first month of our marriage, slept on the floor. <laughs> we didn't mind. Just saying. Now listen, the groom would make sure that this dwelling place was beautiful and that it had all the provisions necessary to sustain a seven-day honeymoon because they, they would barely come out of that room, that dwelling place, for seven days. It usually took the groom about a year to finish that bridal chamber. But listen, it was the groom's father who decided when it was finished. The father was the final judge on when the bridal chamber was ready, when the groom could go for his bride. Like if you were to run into the groom during that season of him building this bridal chamber and say, hey man, when's the big day? His answer would be, only my father knows the day or the hour. Last week we learned that that phrase no man knows the day or the hour, is a hint. It's a Jewish remez, a hint that rabbis would use to help their students remember specifically the Feast of Trumpets. No man knows the day hour or, the, or the hour equals the Feast of Trumpets. We'll come back to that. Let's talk about the bride. For the bride, all she had to do was remain faithful and wait. In fact, the bride was, was actually referred to as consecrated. They would call her consecrated. They would say she's set apart. They would say that she's bought with a price. That she's a lady in waiting. And listen, a year is a long time to be without the one that you've promised yourself to. And you know that other dudes are going to come to her and make a contract. Offer her, offer to sweep her away, to take her away, to draw her away. But her groom had already paid the high price. And there was no doubt in her mind that her groom would come back for her. So wherever she went, she wore a veil. This let everyone know I'm spoken for. And with great confidence, with great anticipation, she remained faithful and she waited. And she spent her time making herself ready. But she wasn't alone. She had bridesmaids with her. Unmarried friends who faithfully attended to her. And they kept lamps burning. Because a groom always came in an unknown hour of the night. It was said that he was a thief in the night because he would come at an unknown hour and steal her away. <laughs> so eventually the season came to an end, right? The year was up. The room was ready. The father said, go. And the groom took off because <laughs> he was ready, right? But he didn't go alone. He had groomsmen and these guys would run ahead of him shouting, he's coming, 
he's coming. And they would blow the shofar. That was pretty good. Did you hear that? I went, man, who needs that thing? We got it. They would blow the shofar. He's coming. He's coming. Blow the shofar, announcing his arrival. And when he gets there, he steals the bride away. But get this. The bride was placed on a chair with poles. And she was lifted up from the ground and carried all the way back to that chamber, that dwelling place that her groom had prepared for her. So now the groom and his bride would go into the bridal chamber while the wedding party waited outside. It's just a little awkward, right? <laughs> awkward. <laughs> when the groom let his best man know that the marriage had been consummated, the best man would let everyone else know. Even more awkward, right? <laughs> it's just whole situation is a little awkward. But listen, that's when the party begins. That's when the party begins. And listen, and, and you need to remember this. The Jewish wedding lasted seven days while the groom and his bride were in the bridal chamber doing whatever they were doing, probably something like this. During the seven days that the groom and his bride are celebrating, friends and family of this couple would provide food and entertainment and feasting and celebration. Some of the people were around the whole time. Some people might have to leave for a few days or whatever. But at the end of that seven days, everybody came back and they had a huge feast, the wedding feast, a massive wedding supper. Let's go ahead and pause right here. If you've been walking with the Lord a while and have a strong foundation in the scriptures, then you've probably already started connecting some dots. But this may be new for some of you. And so I really want to make sure that we all walk away with a, a, a good picture of what's going on, but also the ability to connect more dots on your own, in your own time. Okay? We're going to look at Matthew 24. So go ahead and turn there in your Bible. I want you to read these words in your own Bible. I encourage you to bring a, a real Bible with real pages. Seriously, it's, it's easier to remember the Word of God when you see it that way. At some point, you can think of a verse and you'll actually know exactly in your Bible where it's at. You'll know it by memory. Somebody can say, hey, where's that at? And in, in my Bible, I, I've just seen that so many times. I know where it's at on a page in a portion of the book. I may not know the reference or the exact number, but I can remember roughly where it's at. It's important to have a real Bible. Amen? And bring that. Mark things. Take notes. In Matthew 24, which is one of the greatest discussions in the Bible about end times, and it's Jesus talking, right? Matthew 24, we'll start in verse 36. He says, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, before uh, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they were oblivious. Everybody say oblivious. oblivious. Say it one more time. Oblivious. oblivious. It says that they were oblivious until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day on which your Lord will come. But understand this, if the homeowner had known in which watch of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. It would not have left his house, let his house be broken into. For that reason, you must also be ready because the son of man will come at an hour you do not expect. 
Last week we talked about how Jesus seems to be hinting that he will come and, and, and take his church home on the Feast of Trumpets. We can't say 100% for sure, right? We don't know the future. But let's look at the very next thing that Jesus says. Look at how he opens up Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable. It will be like, it can be compared to 10 virgins, 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay, so this sounds familiar, right? Yes, he's now comparing the end times to a Jewish wedding. By the way, Jewish people called the Feast of Trumpets the wedding day of Messiah. <laughs> Look what he goes on and says. He says, five of these bridesmaids were foolish and five were prudent or wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent, the wise, took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, and that's just a way of saying it was an unknown day or hour. They didn't know exactly where, when he was coming. All they knew was to wait until he got there. While the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy, began to sleep. But at the midnight, at midnight, there was a shout. <laughs> what time? Midnight. At midtime, there was a midnight. There was a what? Shout. There was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent, the wise answered, get your own oil. Well, not exactly like that. No, there will not be enough for us. And you too, listen, go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourself. In other words, it's your responsibility. You are responsible for your own oil. You are responsible for your own oil. While they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day or the hour. Let me say again that Jesus didn't just announce the event. He handed out the program. When you walk into a wedding, what's the first thing they put in your hand? A program. Right? And you ne when you're at a wedding, you never have to guess what's about to happen. It's written right there on the program. You don't know exactly what time the bride's going to march down the aisle. You just know that she will. Right? You don't know the exact point when the minister's going to say, kiss the bride. You may now kiss the bride. You just can't wait to watch, right? <laughs> you don't know when, you're, when the bride's Aunt Lulu is going to sing some Celine Dion song. <laughs> you just know that she will. And you're just hoping this time it'll be better. <laughs> Listen, we know that these things will happen at a wedding because they've been written down. They've been handed out. How many of you have ever been to a wedding or a really any event when you walk through the door and they put a program in your hand and the first trash can you come to, you toss it in? Or you ladies might stick it in your purse so that you can have something to put your gum in later. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we all do that. But then the event's going on, the program's moving forward and something amazing happens or something terrible. One of the two. And you're like, what just happened? And you're digging in your purse to try to find the program. You're like, who was that? What in the world was that? You guys know what I'm talking about? Y'all are all shaking your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Listen, we've got to be careful 
that that's not what we're doing with the Bible. Only looking at it when we're caught off guard, when something's going wrong, when something terrible is happening. When we're out of the loop or we feel like we, or somehow we're behind the eight ball, we got to catch up. Listen, when you know the word, you know what's coming. Isn't that right? When you know the word, you know what's coming. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul's talking about the end times. And he said, while people are saying peace and safety, while people are saying peace and safety, in other words, they'll be aloof. They won't be paying attention to the program. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, you brothers, you're not in the darkness so that so that this day would overtake you like a thief. Amen. I mean, true or false, we've picked up the program. True or false. We have the program. We have it in our hand. We know what's coming. We're not in the dark. If anything, we're in the know, right? He says, for you are all sons of the light, sons of the day. We don't belong to the night or to the darkness. This day should not overtake us like a thief. Okay. The reality is, is I I can't tell you exactly how or when all these end times things might happen. I can't. I don't know the future. I'm not Jesus. But I think I can give you a glimpse of the program. Okay, so let me show you God's end times program as it relates to this Jewish custom of marriage. Okay, you with me? I'm going to go fast. In a Jewish wedding... A marriage covenant, the ketubah, with promises is made in writing by the groom. In our wedding, a new covenant full of promises is made in writing to us by Jesus, who is the word. In a Jewish wedding, the couple breaks bread and drinks from the cup to seal the covenant and their betrothal. In our wedding, Jesus broke bread and drank from the cup at the last supper, sealing the new covenant in his blood. And listen, that's why every time we take communion, every time we eat that bread, drink that cup, it's like we are saying, I love being married to Jesus. In a Jewish wedding, The groom pays the price expressing to the bride his great love for her. In our wedding, Jesus paid the price for us on the cross. This shows us, his bride, his great love for us. In a Jewish wedding, the groom makes a speech of promise to his bride that he would come for her soon. In our wedding. Jesus' speech is recorded as a promise to us, his bride, that he will come again for us soon. In a Jewish wedding, the groom prepares a place for his bride and builds a room addition on his father's house. In our wedding, Jesus says he goes to prepare a place for us in his father's house where there are many rooms, many mansions. In the Jewish wedding, the father is the only one who knows the day or hour of the groom's return for his bride. In our wedding, Jesus said that no one but the father knows the day or the hour of his return for us, his bride. In the Jewish wedding, the groom comes for the bride in the dark hours of the night, like a thief in the night. In our wedding, Jesus will come for us at the midnight cry, like a thief in the night in the darkest season of history. In the Jewish wedding, when the bridegroom comes, the groomsmen run out ahead and shout that he is coming by blowing the shofar. In our wedding, Jesus, our groom, will come with a shout 
and with the trumpet of God. In the Jewish wedding, the bride is lifted up off the ground and carried in the air to meet her groom. In our wedding, we will be caught up in the air and taken away to meet with Jesus. In the Jewish wedding, the groom takes his bride to her bridal chamber where they celebrate for seven days. In our wedding, Jesus will take us to the dwelling places he has prepared for us and we will celebrate for a period of seven years. We've come to know this seven years as the tribulation. After celebrating for seven days, the groom comes out with his bride and there's a huge wedding feast. In our wedding, we too, after seven years of celebration, have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now listen, and, and I may get into this um, a little more next week. But how that seven years plays into a Jewish wedding may very well be the key to when Jesus comes to steal away his bride. The seven-day celebration doesn't start in the Jewish wedding. The celebration, the seven-day celebration does not start until that Jewish bride is lifted up from the earth, carried away in the air to the dwelling place her groom has prepared. If the program holds true, then that means that Jesus will come for his bride before the world goes through seven years of tribulation on this earth. Why is that important? Again, I may give you a few reasons next week, but for, t for this morning, for today, I, let me just say this. Because that means it could happen at any moment. It could happen at any moment. Maybe on the Feast of Trumpets. Maybe this year. <laughs> we still got time. <laughs> right? Or maybe next year. Or maybe some year. Or maybe not on the Feast of Trumpets at all. Maybe Jesus will come for his bride on Valentine's Day. Here's my point. Whatever day or hour Jesus comes, don't you want to go? Don't we, don't we want to be caught up? Snatched from this earth, stolen away? To meet him in the air? Isn't that what we want? Isn't that such a better option? Yes. Pay attention to the program. If you want to be carried away to the place he has prepared. Listen, the foolish bridesmaid, they, they, they weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They, they were caught off guard. They had no oil in their lamps. Oil in scripture usually represents the Holy Spirit. That's why we preached on the Holy Spirit the weeks leading up to this. Listen, the Holy Spirit, we are drawn to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. We are born again of the Spirit of God. We are led on a daily basis by the Spirit. We are comforted, we are counseled, we are convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want you to stand with me. I want to end this morning just by just asking you, what is... 
how is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now? How is he moving? You may be here this morning, and for the first time, there is something in you that is compelling you to cry out to God. I remember the day that I gave my life to Jesus, that I put my trust in Jesus. It was at a Christian concert, wonderful songs, and then a powerful gospel message at the end. And I got to tell you, I could not stay in my seat. I had to walk that aisle. I had to say yes to that invitation. Something was compelling me. Something was moving me. I went down to that aisle and I got on my knees and I said the prayer and I filled out the card. And my life's been different ever since. So you may be here this morning and, and, and either for the first time or maybe the hundredth time. The Holy Spirit's drawing you, compelling you to put your faith, your trust, your hope in Jesus. So here's what I want to ask you to do. I want everyone to close their eyes. And if that's you, I, 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 can't, I can't not ask you, invite you this morning, if that's you, to respond. I, I'm not going to make you come down an aisle. We're not going to do anything like that this morning. But if you've never put your trust in Jesus, if you haven't paid attention to the program, if you think, I don't think I'm going to be carried away, to the place that he has prepared for me. But you want to. You know you're being drawn right now by the Holy Spirit. I just want you to lift your hand. I just want you to put your hand in the air. And listen, there are hands going up. Listen, everybody look down. This isn't, there's hands going up. And so you're not alone. It's okay. Maybe things have been about religion instead of relationship for you. That's okay. God's like, today is the day of salvation. Today's a new day. His mercies are new every morning. And if today's the day for you to put your faith in Jesus and to seal the deal, I want you to raise your hand. It's good. You can put your hand down. Please, please. I'm pretty sure I'll be able to remember your faces. But please come to me and talk to me about that. Or my wife or someone in our leadership. Everyone else, I want you to just look up. Everybody look up. Most of the people in this house have already made that decision to put their trust in Jesus. Hasn't always been easy, but you've been going for it. I want to encourage you, and at home, you may be here and you may, you may have lifted your hand up while I go at home. Please let us know, even right there in the chat box. Say, hey, that was me. I, or they have some sort of thing where you can virtually raise your hand. I love that. It's awesome. But most of us have done that. And we've been trying to live for the Lord in this dark hour. And it's not easy. And we have felt the other lovers coming to offer us a contract. And it's been hard to say no. It's been hard to keep that veil on. But can I encourage you? Don't remove that veil. Don't remove that veil until the day that you meet with your groom. Amen. Jesus said, I'm going to come. Will I find any who are faithful? I believe he will. And I believe there are many of the faithful that are in this room. But we need each other. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the community that we're in, right? We're told in, in Hebrews 10 that we need our community all the more as the day of the Lord approaches. Not to give up on the gathering, but to come together. This morning, I, 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 I can just feel the encouragement in the air. Some of you are so encouraged. We need that all the more as it gets darker and darker and darker. But as we learned last week, the darker it gets, the closer we get to being with our groom. Amen. So stand firm. Hold fast the confession of your, your, your um, hope without wavering. For he who promised is 
faithful. Amen. Can I pray for you? Lord, I pray for everyone that's here. So glad, so glad that I'm in the house of the Lord with so many saints that love you and have put their trust in you. I'm thankful for the ones this morning that have put their faith in you. Just by raising their hand, they're saying, that's me, today's the day. And I pray that we would all walk out of here with that continual confession on our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, that belief in our heart that he's the son of God and was raised from the dead, and that faithful hope inside of us that he will come again. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.